Computers have, have always been used in warfare ever since they, they were invented. And, and indeed, the precursors to computers were used before there were the modern computers. These days, they're used in, in all these sorts of areas. They're used to enable drones to be flown in uh, remote countries um, out of RAF Waddington, um, launched in the remote countries, flown for hours at a time by teams of people in RAF Waddington. Um, they're used for weapons guidance. They're used for satellite communications and for satellite navigation. They're used in all kinds of ways for command and control. And, and as we shall see, this has created a, a lot of power for the nation states that can afford to build big military systems. It's also created some interesting vulnerabilities. And one of the topics of this, this lecture is the way in which the nature of cyberspace and the availability of offensive cyber is changing the whole strategy behind, um, behind warfare, behind, behind military activity, and in my opinion, ought to affect quite a lot of other national strategies in order to maintain national security. But we'll, we'll come on to that, and I look forward to hearing what you think. Warfare is traditionally geographic, of course. Um, you, you want to defend your own territory, occupy your opponent's territory, preserve your freedom of movement for your troops, prevent the, the opponents getting their supplies, make sure you've got your supply lines protected, control strategic geographic points in order that you can achieve these geographic aims. That's, that's been the nature of warfare. But cyberspace is, is different. When, when space became a dimension for warfare um, beyond the, the land, sea and air and, and subsea domains, it, it changed things quite a bit because, of course, it, it gave panoptic surveillance to the military. But cyberspace is really different. It's another dimension in which warfare can be conducted and increasingly, as we, we shall see, is being conducted. And, it, and it, because it's different, and because it's another dimension, orthogonal to the others, it changes the nature of, of the way that you want to fight battles in the others. And cyberspace is, is often felt to be just a, an information space. But it's far more than that. Firstly, it's very dynamic. It, it comes and goes. Um, new... new paths through cyberspace appear and disappear all the time. New networks are created and joined into the internet. Places become addressable and stop being addressable. Cyberspace is potentially addressable, although with some difficulties, uh, depending on what, what address mechanisms you're using. But those addresses aren't necessarily tied to fixed devices or fixed geographic locations. So you've got something which is highly structured and yet amorphous and changing all the time. And of course, it, it carries information, some online, some of the offline information is still cyberspace because it will be used to affect the way in which things happen in, in the rest of cyberspace. But it's also a, an action network. It's a, it's a space of activity and commands, and that's becoming increasingly true, particularly with, with the Internet of Things, as we, we saw in, in my recent lecture. More devices with more actuators on them actually able to affect the physical world as a result of commands that have been sent through cyberspace. It's also... It, it breaks down the time dimension because you don't have to move things physically in order to reach a long way across cyberspace. And it's the world's most trusted source of information and alarmingly, Facebook is currently the world's most trusted source of news. So warfare in cyberspace potentially changes everything 
because there's no, no borders, no latency, weapons can be deployed from anywhere to anywhere instantly. And offensive cyber weapons are cheap, particularly if you steal them. And it, last year, a man called Harold Martin was accused of, of stealing 50 terabytes of information from the tailored access operations group within the American National Security Agency. That's their elite cyber group, including 75% of their cyber weapons. Now, if you can steal cyber weapons that have been developed by a state, it makes a really big difference to the balance of power. Because nation states traditionally have got enormous military platforms and, and the barrier to acquiring them is huge because it co they cost a lot of money, they take decades to develop quite often, but they enable you to project very substantial kinetic power and, and then to use, to, by threatening to use that power, they, they strengthen your diplomacy so you can use them for, for threats as well. That's what gives the nation states traditionally their overwhelming power over much, much smaller countries and, and smaller groups. But cyber weapons, because they're, they're cheap to obtain and very, very powerful, are starting or, or have already changed that balance of power between the major nation states and, uh, and, and the much smaller adversary countries and, and other groups. So the advantage held by the, the major states is going, and I think going at an accelerating rate, and that's causing quite a lot of alarm in the military, but, but not yet affecting their strategy enough, as, as we shall see. So if you're faced with the possibility of, of a cyber attack, it's... It really does change the way in which your policy ought to develop and how you ought to do things. At a, a major lecture given by the head of defence intelligence, Air Marshal Osborne, to the Royal United Services Institute, the defence think tank in London, uh, just two or three weeks ago, he said that a, a full-scale cyber attack could cripple a country in minutes. Now... Previously, that's really only been possible using nuclear weapons. And I have heard people in, in the Ministry of Defence discussing the, the thought that actually with really powerful cyber weapons, you don't need a nuclear deterrent anymore because the cyber capability would be enough to deter a nuclear attack. Uh, that certainly hasn't made it through to any kind of policy position, and I can't see that happening in my lifetime, frankly. But it, it does show the scale of power that some military people, and including, it appears, the head of defence intelligence, see that cyber weapons do have. They're hard to attribute. It's, it's very hard to know who's attacking you if you experience a cyber attack and very hard to be extremely confident about who is attacking you, which makes it hard to respond. It makes it easy, it lowers the barrier to people deciding to attack you if they think that they can get away with it because you won't be able to tell it was them. It makes it more attractive to interfere in other, in other people's battles for your own purposes, to, to interfere in diplomacy that's going on by by launching an attack that might be attributed to somebody else and therefore give you some diplomatic advantage. There are games that can be played, perhaps are being played already, using this new technology, this new capability of offensive cyber. And, and it's, a, it's a funny place to be, talking about offensive cyber. When I was doing some, some work as part of the um, defence... Um, Science Advisory Committee really just four or five years ago now, it was top secret that, that an offensive cyber capability existed in the UK. 
And, and then a minister inadvertently told a journalist about it, and, and it stopped being secret really, really very rapidly. And, and now, of course, um, the, the country boasts about its, its cyber strength and, and is, um, has advertised the fact that it's, it's recruiting tens of thousands of additional people to, to boost that, that strength. So it, it really is a, a, a challenging time for military strategy. Nation states like most of the Western states are very concerned about collateral damage when they use their weapons. Kinetic weapons, you can reasonably, assuming that you're targeting them accurately, and they're not bad these days, you can, you can calculate and, to a degree, control the extent to which the damage that is done beyond the, the initial target occurs. Very hard to do that with, with cyber weapons, as, as we'll see with some of the examples that, that I've got. Um, and therefore, the inhibitions for um, law-abiding states um, against using cyber weapons are much stronger than they are for, for rogue states or terrorist groups or insurgents or, or teenagers in their bedrooms because there, there aren't the same legal constraints, the same um, challenges within the society to, to behave in a particular way. So again, that, that shifts the balance of power. You, you have an aircraft carrier. One of the things that aircraft carriers are really useful for is, is helping diplomacy. You, you, you go and park offshore somewhere when, when you've got some dispute going on with that country. And, and the, the pressure that comes from having that amount of kinetic weaponry sitting just, just outside your territorial waters helps your negotiators in in their diplomacy to, uh, to win their argument. And you see that happening all the time. And just the fact that um, significant military platforms are moving towards a potential battle zone does have a, an effect on, on the way in which the situation develops. How can you use that power if the country that you're threatening phones up the BBC and says, if that aircraft carrier isn't steaming in the other direction in an hour's time, I'm going to knock over King's College Hospital. And then they demonstrate that they can do that. And then they phone up the BBC and say, OK, if it's not going another way in an hour now, I'm going to knock over all the UK's hospitals for example, and I've demonstrated I can do it. I don't think that that aircraft carrier would continue moving towards that, that battle area under those circumstances, and if it did, I think the government would fall after the attack. So you, it's very hard to see how some of these really big platforms can be used in their traditional way in future, quite apart from the fact that, that of course, they are themselves floating computer systems uh, and therefore themselves vulnerable to cyber attack if they can't be perfectly protected. And to protect them perfectly, you've got to protect their complete supply chain. And, and if you look at the, the number of, of CDs or DVDs of, of data and updates and, and patches and fixes and new software that get loaded onto a destroyer when it goes into port for a refit, um, or just routine maintenance, uh, you realise the scale of that challenge alone, just protecting those systems from, from potential infiltration by, by malicious actors. So there are challenges there, and countries have reacted differently. Um, the Americans are, are very hot that they really don't want, uh, for example, to have... Um, Chinese technology inside their critical national infrastructure. So they have prohibited Huawei, for example, from certain key functions within, within their infrastructure. Uh, the UK has a completely different attitude, um, largely because of our industrial policy, which very much relies on, on not alienating China. And that's just one country. I'm, 
it, it's very easy to see how, how much damage it would do to, to uh, an industrial policy that wants to be open to the world if you tried to keep out of all critical areas of national infrastructure, all the technology that could be subverted by, by a software update or could already have been subverted by any country that could potentially become an adversary. Very difficult to, to see how, how you'd operate an open economy under those circumstances. And yet, if we were supplying, if Britain, if, if British companies were supplying really key technology into really critical parts of some overseas countries' infrastructure, um, from my perspective, it would be a dereliction of duty if, if our offensive cyber people weren't managing to infiltrate that supply chain. So you can, you can see the tensions there and, and the significance of, of industrial policy in the context of military policy. And Western countries, because we are so technology dependent, are very vulnerable to anything that really hurts technology. And we are very heavily dependent on satellites in the West, much more than, for example, North Korea is. And yet, um, an electromagnetic pulse in space would knock out an awful lot of satellites because not, not well, the civil ones aren't, aren't radiation hardened to anything like the extent that GPS satellites are, for example. And a nuclear explosion generates an electromagnetic pulse that, that destroys electronics. So there's, there's vulnerabilities that are created by your technical sophistication in this new world of offensive cyber and, and other forms of, of attack on cyber systems. I, I seem to specialise in giving lectures that stop people sleeping at night. I apologise for that. The, the poster child for, for major cyber uh, attacks is, is really Stuxnet, although it wasn't the first. But, but Stuxnet is, is an interesting one because, because it was so very sophisticated, so very effective, uh, and, and because uh, it's been analysed to a, to a very great degree now by, by academics who, who got hold of the, the malware. It was an attack on, on the Iranian uh, technology for, for uh, concentrating uranium. So their nuclear program, their, they say their civil nuclear program. Um, and um, in the bottom left here is, is yellow cake. It's, it's mined uranium, um, uranium oxide. Very high proportion of it, 99.3% is, is uranium-238. And, and only a tiny 0.7% is uranium-235, the uranium isotope that you want if you're powering a nuclear, fueling a nuclear reactor or, or indeed building a nuclear bomb. And, and you need to concentrate. Firstly, you need to separate those two isotopes, and you can't do it chemically, of course, because they're chemically identical, that, that being isotopes. So the only difference you've got is the physical difference of, of one of them being just, just a very slight bit heavier than the other. Um, and you need to concentrate it so that you get to between 3 and 4% of, of 235 for a, for a reactor, up to you know, more than 90% if you're building a bomb. And the way you do that is that you turn the uranium into uranium hexafluoride, a gas, and you run it through gas centrifuges, big, big tubes that spin at supersonic speeds and spin the heavier isotope out to the edge so that you can, can take the lighter isotope out from, from the centre. And it's a very slow process because separating them requires a cascade. You have to run the gases through one centrifuge after another. Um, the, um, at, at the time of, uh, of the Stuxnet attack, the Iranians had 7,000 uh, gas centrifuges in about, I think, 15 or, or 20 um, individual cascades. So um, they, they were... They were, were managing to, to um, it was calculated that, that they were concentrating uh, U-235 at a level that, that was producing enough for a bomb every 
six months or so. Um, or, of course, enough, enough for a nuclear reactor much, much more rapidly than that. And, and this is a, an aerial photograph of, of where it was all happening. Now, the, those gas centrifuges are controlled by industrial controllers, um, in this case uh, made by Siemens. And um, the controllers, because they're controlling something that's safety critical and military significant, uh, are, are air-gapped from the network. They're not, they're, there's no network connection to them. So you, if you want to attack them, you, you can't do it directly. Um, a plan was conceived to get across that air gap uh, by writing some very sophisticated malware that could be got into the supply chain for the people who did maintenance on those controllers uh, and by infecting their computers, hope that the malware would get carried across on a USB stick into the air gap network that, that uh, was managing the Siemens controllers. And of course, in order then to be able to do anything useful, you had to really understand all the command structure of the Siemens controllers and, and the way that the network worked and so on. So it was, it was a sophisticated piece of work that had to be done. Uh, and it was successful. And what the malware did was to very subtly change the speed of the centrifuges, because if they did anything dramatic, the operators would notice something was wrong and shut them down. And then if it was happening to a lot of them, they'd realise that they'd, they'd been attacked and they'd close it down and, and refresh all the computer systems and you'd have to start again. So what they did was to change the speed very, very subtly up and down to a point where the, the operators didn't notice that anything was wrong, but uh, it caused the, the gas centrifuges to wear out faster. So the replacement cycle went up, which slowed down the entire process of building up lots and lots and lots more gas centrifuges and, and made the entire process uh, much less efficient. It was a very clever, technically very clever piece of work, and it was only discovered because in, in infecting the, the supply chain, of course, the, the malware got out into the wild and it turned out that uh, it was um, crashing Windows computers. It was, it was a bit of Windows malware initially that, that contained the, uh, the payload that controlled the, uh, the, the Siemens systems. And um, it, was, it was crashing uh, Windows systems that had absolutely nothing to do with, with the Iranian um, a nuclear program in countries that had really nothing to do with Iran. I, I think I think one of the first instances was in Sweden, um, but because it was detected that something was causing these crashes to occur, and finally it was isolated and analysed, and and the whole truth came out. Now, as I say, that, that wasn't the the first nation. Cyber attack. I mean, it was attributed to the USA and Israel working together. I don't think they've ever admitted that, that they were involved, um, and perhaps never will. Um, but um, that that appears to be widely widely believed to be uh, who was who was really behind Stuxnet. Um, but there had been there had been attacks before, and there there have been a number of, of attacks subsequently, um, and. There have been lots of attacks on, on Estonia, for example, which have, have been attributed to, to the Russians um, for, for various political reasons. Um, the, the attack by the, the Stuxnet attack on, on Iran really woke up Iran to the potential of, of offensive cyber and, and seems to have caused them to develop their own offensive cyber capability, which, which was then used, it is believed... Um, to attack the Saudi Aramco oil company um, in 2012. And, and that was, was a devastating attack. I mean, it caused crashes in, in all their offices around, around the world to the point where they, they took all their offices off the, any networks in order to isolate them, to stop the, uh, the trouble spreading so that they were in a position to rebuild their systems. They, they had to strip down their systems and rebuild them completely from scratch. And that involved buying a vast number of, of new hard disks, completely clean, straight from the factory, uncompromised hard disks. 
uh, and that caused a world shortage of hard disks at the time. It, it, was, it was such a major activity. It, it disrupted their sales activities, because you know, Saudi Aramco is, is a huge distributor of oil, um, that, that um, they, they actually, because they, they continued to pump oil, uh, they ended up with, with very large reserves and, and were giving it away in, in Saudi Arabia in order to make sure that fuel was available for, for their own citizens uh, and because they weren't in a position to, to make uh, sales overseas. And it was claimed by, by a, um, a small activist group, but um, very, very attributed to, to Iran. There's more detail of this as of, of everything else in, in the paper that I've written to accompany this. And attacks on Saudi Arabia have, have continued. I mean, there's one, um, this, this um, um, web report is, uh, is a, an attack on the, on the safety systems of, uh, of Saudi Aramco um, in, in 2017, so fairly recently. Um, again, attributed to Iran with uh, possible um, Russian involvement. There's big... DDoS attack on, on American banks cost them a lot of money. They managed to fight it off themselves with a bit of help from the uh, Department of Homeland Security. But it was, it was said to be the largest um, distributed denial of service attack in the world at, at the time, um, attributed to, to Iran. There was um, there been lots of cyber attacks against, against South Korea. It's, it's been said that North Korea attacks... Uh, South Korea with, with cyber weapons um, once a day, typically, uh, at some level, although that's probably calmed down a bit just, just at the moment since peace seems to be breaking out there. Um, but um, obviously, you know, where there are tensions and where there's capability, then, then you're going to get attacks of some sort. There's a um, big attack on, on Sony Pictures. Um, Again, claimed by a, by a group, but, uh, but attributed to, uh, to North Korea. But lots of attacks, um, including some really quite recently on the Ukrainian power grid and that, that took, the, took the grid down and took the phone system down to make it harder for, for them to recover from the attack on the power grid. Uh, and that's been attributed uh, directly to the Russian government by the UK Foreign Office. Um, Lord Armand of, of Wimbledon, the uh, Foreign Office Minister, has attributed that. And, and that was, that was, that is the NotPetya uh, ransomware um, um, vehicle. And NotPetya then got out into the wild and, and caused huge amounts of damage to all kinds of, of countries around the place. And the and WannaCry that hit the NHS, again, was a, um, a, an offensive cyber weapon. Actually, I think the same vulnerability and the same underlying attack engine that, that the NotPetya uh, software was, was using that had been developed by the National Security Agency, again, by the, by the TAO elite group. Uh, but it got stolen, it got posted on the internet, and in the case of WannaCry, was then hijacked by, by some cyber criminals and used as the basis for the ransomware attack, which, you know, it, it disrupted 30,000 computers in, in a large number of countries around the world. Uh, and if, uh, the, the National Audit Office report on, on the effect it had on the NHS is well worth reading. It gives you, and that was just, you know, collateral damage, that was just a side effect of... Uh, of an attack that was was not really targeted at the NHS at all, and there have been quite a lot of attacks uh, attributed to, to China, including one that um, was an attack on the on the Dalai Lama in two thousand and eight, which uh, Ross Anderson at Cambridge University did a lot to to help um, diagnose and and fix, and has written up in academic papers. So again, I've I've got references to these things in the in the transcript if you want to follow them up. Um, why, why have people done this? Well, theft of intellectual property, particularly stealing, stealing details of weapons, of course, but, but attacks on universities to steal intellectual property for commercial advantage, lots of those um, by states and, and um, people related to, to state activities. Um, general disruption, financial gain, people demonstrating power for, for policy reasons, 
uh, and reconnaissance. Um, most big companies experience quite a lot of, of what they call cyber attacks every day. And these, these vary from trivial probes, which could be somebody trying to find out what software they're running in order that they can do something nefarious, or it could be somebody you know, just doing a bit of basic research or just searching the whole of the internet, looking to see what, what's there at particular addresses. So some of those are genuine malicious start of a cyber attack, and, and probably the vast majority of them are nothing of the sort. And then, of course, there's malicious emails, some of which will be targeted. Um, in, in experiments that have been done, it, it, if you really want to penetrate a company and you're prepared to do the research of um, you know, using LinkedIn and social networks to find out the relationships between different employees at that company so that you can, you can target people with a what appears to be an email from their boss or from the finance department or from HR. You know, these are very, very good reasons not, not to put details of where you work and what your job is on, on LinkedIn or other social networks. But, hey, that's the way people get work these days. So, um, In research that has been done, you can typically penetrate a company in less than 20 attempts with a, with a phishing email. Uh, people do do click on attachments. They do they do follow links, particularly if it looks like a plausible email, and particularly if it's late on a Friday and looks urgent. Some of the things that that big companies see are indeed nation state related, because we know that nation states are doing the research to penetrate systems in order to pre-position. Um, essentially um, we cyber weaponry so that you know you need to compromise the system so that you can exploit it when you need to rather than simply finding a vulnerability and hoping that it will still be there when you need it um, because software manufacturers keep patching the vulnerabilities it's terrible it makes it makes you, know, you have to do the job all over again um, this is some data that was was published earlier this year um, by the Joint National Security Strategy Committee, which has been holding a, um, an inquiry into, into the national security strategy. And, and BT gave evidence, and it is the um, normal um, process of, of parliamentary committees in the UK that, that evidence is put on, on the internet. And so at a, at a certain point, they've published all the, the evidence that they've received, and, and I've just taken this out of some, some data that BT provided. The, it, it shows the, the number of serious attacks um, that, that exposed vulnerabilities that, in BT's view, would have done really serious damage had the attack not been stopped in other ways. And the green bars at the bottom are the external direct attacks on, on BT. The, the blue ones at the top are of um, serious vulnerabilities that BT found themselves doing penetration testing and, and other analyses of, of their own systems. And as you can see, that spans from January 13 to January 17. And just for completeness, that's, that's the following year up to, to January 18. So there's a, a significant number. Um, BT say that the, the number of attacks since about... Um, 2014 has gone up a thousandfold, the, the rate of attack, and, and that the sophistication has also increased quite significantly over that time. They say that, that these are the, the sort of reasons why people attack, you know, activists who are, who are just defacing portals and, and trying to make a point, um, criminals, terrorists, and, and nation states. And they say that... that um, Almost all of the attacks, in their view, um, that they're experiencing are from organised crime. Now, it, um, it occurs to me that if BT were to say that actually what they thought was that they were being attacked by terrorists or by, by nation states with increasingly significant attacks, that might have some political ramifications that might lead them not to want to say that. So, um, personally, I'm... I'm open-minded about who, in fact, is behind the attacks that, that they were reporting to, 
to the uh, parliamentary committee. But it, it was an interesting evidence, and, and there's, there's much more detail in, in the online evidence, and again a reference in the, in the transcript. This is a, a report from the UK National Cybersecurity Centre that was, um, was leaked um, the, fairly recently. The report was written in, in July last year. And what it shows is that the National Cybersecurity Centre knows that um, s people associated with, with nation state offensive cyber are probing and almost certainly compromising industrial control systems in the UK. This, this is a, something that is of concern to us at the Health and Safety Executive, of course, because there, you know, there are lots of major hazard sites uh, in the UK, not, not just critical natural infrastructure sites, but you know, oil refineries and, and um, chemical plants and fuel storage depots, and you know, any, anywhere where if something went significantly wrong, uh, it might actually kill or injure some to, to many people. Uh, and, and HSE is, is the regulator, safety regulator, and so uh, is putting more and more effort into um, making sure that, that a, the um, inspectors look at the cyber security of major hazard sites as well as their physical security and their internal processes and you know, whether their pipes are corroded and all the things that, that you would normally do in, in carrying out a, a proactive inspection of, of a control of major accident hazard site. So, you know, again, this, this just raises the, the threat level, the fact that um, some of these sites are, are being, being looked at, no doubt. And there have been statements that have come out of um, GCHQ and related agencies in, in the past saying that, uh, as, as a working hypothesis, people ought to assume that their systems have already been compromised. Uh, although... It, it's very difficult to know what you do about these things because so much of our, even our critical national infrastructure is in private hands and the decision as to how much you're going to invest in cyber security is a, a board decision for a board that's accountable to its shareholders, not to, to the citizens of the UK or to Parliament or to GCHQ or to the Cabinet Office or, or any of the other agencies. So it... It's a process of, of um, discussion and negotiation and, and trying to help people to do the right things but to remain proportionate to the genuine threat. Um, whether people get the, right, the balance right is, is you know, your guess is as good as mine. Now, given all that background to, to the power of offensive cyber, you might think that it would be a good idea to be pressing for a, an offensive cyber non-proliferation treaty. Uh, you might think that. I might think that. Uh, the UK government doesn't think that. Um, this is, I've just clipped this out of a, uh, the UK-Poland cyber cooperation commitment that was published at the end of last year. Uh, affirming states' legitimate right to develop both offensive and defensive cyber capabilities. Now, swap cyber for nuclear, and somehow you, you just could not imagine the government saying that. So there, there is something strange about the way in which the cyber threat is viewed at a policy level. And, and I, I think it's worth highlighting. And of course, there are other ways to use cyberspace for military and diplomatic purposes. And psychological operations have always been a very strong part of warfare because if you can demoralize the enemy's forces or the enemy's population, you can, you can win a war almost without firing any bullets. And modern social media and the amount of data that is collected um, on social media and by companies is a really rich resource that makes psychological operations ever so much easier, um, both for the UK and its, its own offensive cyber activities, and of course for, for anybody else in the world. And we, we can see already that, you know, we know that there has been interference in, in Trump's election because um, the, the social media companies have revealed the number of fake accounts, the number of bots that were actually 
um, posting and influencing and the, the breach of, of the messages that came from, from those and how the targeting was being done. We've seen the, all, all the, the stuff that came out of the um, Cambridge Analytica revelations fa fairly recently. We've seen that a lot of the um, Russian um, based accounts that were used to influence the Trump election were also used um, to, to post messages in the Brexit referendum um, in, in the UK. It's, it's clear that at, at least early skirmishes are going on in this space, not yet clear quite how effective they're being, but it's early days. Pe people will get better. It'll, it'll be good. And of course, you can you, know, you can find out from from social media um, the, the names of soldiers that are currently fighting in any particular battle area and and where their kids go to school in all probability because people post so much family information or their helpful friends do and tag it with with names of of children who turned up at their own children's parties and. You know, and, and with all the facial recognition capabilities in social media, this, this makes it very hard to, to keep things really private. And so the ability to, if you choose to do so, to put pressure on, psychological pressure on individual soldiers by threatening their families uh, is growing and growing all the time. And that's just one example of the kind of psychological operations you can, you can see going on. And, of course, you can manipulate the news. And then there's computers in autonomous weapons. Um, probably the most obvious autonomous weapon is a landmine. Doesn't doesn't necessarily need a, need a computer. And, of course, they, they've been banned by, by the Ottawa Treaty in 1999, um, although quite a lot of countries haven't signed up to that. To that treaty, including some pretty significant ones. There's there's the use of computers in uh, other autonomous weapons systems. So and air defence systems these days are able to to identify a target over the horizon, um, select a weapon, uh, and um, autonomously engage with that target um, and, and fire lots of, uh, of, of bullets at it or, or use missiles or whatever other techniques um, autonomously. Now, there's a, a sort of man-in-the-loop principle for ethical reasons that countries like the UK employ, saying, you know, we don't want to give weapons the right to kill people. It's always got to be a human decision and I'm seriously sceptical about that um, because I, mean, I, I agree it's, it's a policy. Uh, I agree it's a good idea. I agree that, that there is somebody there with, with some override authority. And then I think about the USS Vincennes um, back in, in July 3rd, 1988, which shot down a, an Iranian civil airliner flying on a scheduled service at the right time in uh, international airspace in, a, in a, uh, an air corridor, well published, um, and killed um, 290 people. Um, and why, why did the USS Vincennes shoot it down? Well, apparently because um, the man in the loop was, was told by or, or believed that he had been told by the, the air defence systems that there was an incoming missile and that if he didn't um, authorise engaging with it immediately, uh, then he would die and so would all his colleagues and, and he'd lose his ship. Now, if, if you're a man in the loop, or a woman of course, and you're faced with that decision, given that information and seconds to take a decision, with the consequences of getting it wrong one way being so devastating and the consequences of getting it wrong the other way being at worst a court-martial, what are you going to do? You, know, you, can't, you can't say, well, hold on a minute, I need to think about this. You can't, you can't say, oh, no, no, you've got your calculations wrong. Let me, let me get out a sextant and some paper and see if I can work out what's going on here. Or, or even the, you know, the, the local handbook that tells you what the flight times are of Iranian aircraft on, on civil routes. You don't have time to do anything other than believe what you're being shown on the screen 
or, or, or what you've misinterpreted from what you've been shown on the screen. Because, you know, nobody believes that Captain Rogers really intended to kill those civilians. Um, but it is a good challenge to, to the notion that, that having a person in the loop solves the problem. Now, this is a video I, I mentioned. Um, it's, it's been produced by uh, an organisation that is against letting weapons um, kill people on, uh, on their own. Um, and, and I've only got a few seconds of it. Uh, the rest of it is, is available on, on the internet and, and there's a reference to where you can find it. But, but the scenario is that this is somebody selling weapons uh, at, a, at a major conference for, for weapons. Customer pilots directed almost 3,000 precision strikes last year. We're super proud of it. <coughs> it allows you to separate the bad guys from the good. It's a big deal. But we have something much bigger. Your kids probably have one of these, right? Not quite. Hell of a pilot? No. That skill is all AI. It's flying itself. Its processor can react a hundred times faster than a human. The stochastic motion is an anti-sniper feature. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. They used to say guns don't kill people. People do. Well, people don't. They get emotional. Disobey orders, aim high. Let's watch the weapons make the decisions. Now trust me, these were all bad guys. Now as I say, that, that goes on um, and, and shows what you can do at scale with, with these devices. Um, I, I didn't want to show any more of it because that, that made the point I... I wanted to make. More and more AI will be used in, in weapons systems. And, and so there are some, some big ethics decisions to be, to be taken and some, some real dilemmas of regulation and some, some serious technical challenges because you know, we, we don't know how to make sure that AI systems do what they're really intended to do all the time. Uh, we don't know how to make them cyber secure completely and to prove that they are. But if you, if you regulate this sort of weaponry, what you're doing is deterring the law-abiding, the regulation-abiding nations from using it and probably placing no inhibition at all in front of, of rogue states and terrorist groups and so on. And when this technology exists, it gets out. And the, there's nothing in, in that bit of technology that, that you've just seen that could not be built using off-the-shelf capability now. It's, as far as I know, it hasn't been, um, but then I, would, I wouldn't know because, you know, until somebody's using it, it would, it would certainly be classified. So what do you do in these circumstances? This, this technology is changing warfare, but it's changing society, it's changing other strategies. I, I think cyberspace and, and the threats of hostile cyberspace just, just changes everything. So, we depend on technology. 
inevitably. And the existence of offensive cyber, I think, has got to change the whole way in which we, we police and manage our digital society and our entire national defence strategy. I'm not sure it makes sense to invest lots of money in big military platforms, given the kind of things I've been talking about this evening. That money needs to be put somewhere else where it will be doing something more valuable to, to our society. And as the balance of power changes between the big military powers, which are in the main following reasonably civilised ways of, of operating, even in, in warfare. I say in the main, I, I'd heavily qualify that in some areas, but, but you, you get what I'm saying. As, as that balance of power changes, the world becomes a much more dangerous place. And preparation for cyber warfare has already started. You know, there's a, a standard transition to war process where you position your, your troops in the right places and get your supply lines up. That process is already underway for cyber warfare. And, and we don't know who's winning. Well, at least I don't know who's winning, and you don't know who's winning, and, unless I've been invaded by spooks for this lecture. So, I, I mean... Those of you who've, who've followed my lecture series so far will know that, that the last line here is inevitably where I'm going. We have to use much stronger software engineering. We've got to get rid of the vulnerabilities. It gives us control back over the security of our national infrastructure, our major hazard sites, of a lot of areas of our, our digital society that, that are currently built on very, very badly engineered foundations and therefore very vulnerable to, to being exploited by, by an adversary. So that's me and a little time for questions if you have any. Thank you for listening.